my dad the throttle. How are you doing today? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, but you didn't answer me. <laughs> I'm always doing excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, dentistry, like all medical professions, faces constant change. New technologies are always coming to market. Techniques are evolving and being refined. And dentists feel a lot of pressure to feel on the leading edge of this change in order to be competitive. And also the challenges themselves that, that dentists face change year to year. So we have a list and let's see it. It's the challenges that dentistry is facing in 2021, the biggest challenges. And we're just gonna go over the list really quickly because I actually thought it was a pretty interesting list. So the first one is COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we've had a lot of shows and actually segments and special reports on this, so I won't go through it again because dentists are acutely aware, <laughs> they're acutely aware of all the challenges and the scheduling issues and the PPEs and all that stuff. So yeah, that's on their mind. It's stressful. Yes. Um, and, but I do want to add that dentists have done actually very well at, you know, handling things. I've been oh. to the dentist a couple of times and I've been very impressed with my dentist's office that I've been as to. As much as any profession, dentistry has been there in the early parts of 2020. Mm -hmm. And we did the triage, handle it beautifully, but lots of adjustments. Okay. Number two is financial. And that includes both student loan debt and the cost of running a private practice. Well, alarmingly, dentists in the United States, when they graduate from dental school, they are on average $304,000 in debt, 304,000. So that's gonna be stressful potentially. But then if you go on and specialize, we can look at ortho as an example, and that's double, and that was $617,000 of debt. So you're starting off before you see your first patient with a lot of debt. So in other shows, maybe we can cover that and how to start managing that. They got to get that retired because that's a background conversation that affects all conversations that create all action plans. Just you saying those numbers gives me a little bit of stress. I can't imagine so that. So when you get out of school, then maybe don't open up the Taj Mahal. Maybe be an associate, go to a GPR program. Uh, do an advanced in, uh, educational graduate dentistry program, uh, DSOs, public health. All these are ways that you can start learning more about the craft, making a little bit of income, but not incurring a lot more debt. Yeah, and we did talk about DSOs on our show when we interviewed Gary Glassman. So that you can refer to that if you want. Okay, number three, finding new patients. Well, you find new patients like you always found new patients. They're not necessarily under every rock. So treat people well and people will come back. And so you must also close with your patients and ask, you know, you're not thinking about asking for a referral, but they don't realize you wouldn't be there in the future if there weren't patients to get you through the interim. So how you guarantee you're there in the future for the patient is by being busy. So ask your patients for referrals. Yeah, and I think we talked about in our show we did on practice culture, we talked about that probably if you have a good practice culture, over 50% of your new patients are just from word of mouth from your existing oh, yeah. patient for a general dentist. Yeah, that's absolutely so important. Okay, the fourth thing is time management. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is scheduling. Uh, when we don't have as many patients per day and we have to keep our reception rooms more vacant, then when we get somebody in there, let's do the consultation and let's treatment plan for no surprises and let's schedule the time to not only do the root canal, if you're Cliff Ruddle, but let's get the buildup done and get it back to the general dentist, uh, scheduled so you can do the, the post, the core of the buildup and take an impression and provisionalize. Let's do more work in that time. We've done other segments where we've talked about how costly it is to reschedule that patient. Right, and then also maybe time management um, in terms of just, you know, scheduling time for family and, and recreation as well as work. So that's also balance. Yeah, got to get the balance in there. That's a good point. Stretch, do the yoga, do the running on the beach, do all the things that give you juice so when you're back in there, you can handle and manage the stress. Okay, the next thing, competition, staying ahead of the competition. Oh, come on, welcome competition. Competition isn't good or bad, it just is. If there were no competition, you wouldn't even exist. So welcome the competition and then just get better. And how you get better is train, get role models, uh, uh, get your staff trained up, have fun, and be as effective as you can be. Okay, and the last item on the list is health issues. Oh, health issues. Okay, so dentistry has been known to have a few health issues. Uh, but in essence, if you just get out of the office, uh, clear your mind, 
uh, family, grandkids, children, uh, sports, exercise, all these things refresh, rejuvenate, and recharge so that when we get back in there, we can handle the stress. Right. And then also, I guess dentists have tend to have maybe more back problems from, you know, sitting all day long. So there's there's actually physical and, you know, stress mental health problems, too. Dentistry is actually one of the most suicidal of the medical professions. So don't let it get to that point. Um, OK, well, it does seem very challenging to be a dentist right now. Do you have any encouraging words? <laughs> Confucius. Okay. Confucius, I have it right here. Wouldn't you know, it's right here. The gem cannot be polished without friction, nor man perfected without trials. So welcome every trial that's part of who you are. It's part of the journey. And every time you overcome a little trial and tribulation, you get a little bit better. It's like a muscle. Keep working it. Exercise it. Get strong. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, we have a great show for you today, and we're going to get going on it right now. So for more than 50 years, there's been universal agreement that the endodontic triad for success is shaping canals, cleaning in three dimensions, and filling root canal systems. There has also been majority consensus that the leading cause for endodontic failure is not reducing the bacterial load enough. So for many of you, I just stated the obvious. However, about a decade ago, a group of clinicians came forward promoting the idea that the endodontic triad is dead, outdated, and irrelevant. So we have published articles disputing this idea and addressing it. You've lectured about it. This really is nothing new for us. But recently you read something on the AAE discussion forum that brought this triad controversy to the forefront of our minds again. So today we thought we would devote this segment to talking about it a little bit. So what did you read on the AAE discussion forum that kind of got you going again on it? <laughs> well, that along in itself would probably blow our timeline, but uh, I, I scan it every day to look at the discussion forum. It's 24 seven, so it goes all the time. And uh, I'm always looking for what people are talking about and what's hot and what's not. And so there was this whole discussion about something completely unrelated. And out of it, there was this quote from Herb Branson. And so he comes on and he says that the, uh, the shaping has been decoupled from the so-called triad and it's not anymore a triad. So that was interesting. And there was a couple other things I'll just throw out because it seems like there's rarely evidence on this discussion forum. And there's a lot of clinical cases presented where they show lateral anatomy, furcal canals, lateral canals, apical bifinities, loops, deltas, and astomosis. So it's rare, but when they do, it's almost like they run the flag up because something's been done that's never been done. And the, and the words are usually, did you wave it? Oh, that was a gentle wave case. Oh, you must've waved it. So there's like no recognition that thousands of clinicians get lateral canals every single day without this technology. So when I saw his quote, that's what got me thinking, how can he, decouple something that is fundamental to let us move our reagents, no matter how you do it, and then to fill root canal systems, no matter how you do it. So that was what got it, it all started. Okay, well, one of the first articles that I'm aware of that promotes this idea that the endodontic triad is outdated and irrelevant is, it was published in Dentistry Today in 2016, called Image Guided Endodontics, the Role of the Endod Image Guided Endodontics, the Role of the Endodontic Triad. And the lead author is Dr. John Cotomy. 
And I think the best way to approach this is for me maybe to have me read a few quotes from the article and then you can address those claims. Are you serious? <laughs> I, I think that this is the best way to do it. And I'll explain why actually maybe a little later. But are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So here's the first one. Protocols have been based on the tooth type, not specifically tailored nor executed in appreciation of the morphologic and anatomic uniqueness routinely encountered. They have been drawn as if we were treating intact, unrestored, caries-free teeth. Many of these geometric forms, instruments, and procedural steps have not changed in more than 50 years. Well, in terms of change, it's true that much of what we're doing today is similar to what we were doing in the past. I would say technology has exploded, though. But if you're just talking about sticking instruments inside a canal, that's much the same. If you're talking about irrigating a little bit, that's much the same. And some kind of a filling, that's much the same. But in terms of their cookie cutters and there's no protocols, that's completely uh, just ludicrous. Those of you who have bothered to read the Schilder paper, uh, the 1974 paper, the famous paper, the most downloaded, most recited paper in the world on shaping, realize there is no cookie cutter. Each canal is harbored inside a unique root. The root, root is, uh, has parameters of bulk and uh, form and shape. And so we, uh, if you look at the Schilderian principles, there was never any measurements. There was never any cookie cutter approaches. Every shape was unique. Every shape was specific for that root form and that root that held that root canal system. And the root canal system was further discussed in terms of length, diameter, and curvature or recurvature. So the shapes have been very, very specific for the anatomy. Okay. Um, the next quote, it is about restoring balance. It is about planning access, planning shape using a directed approach and evaluating the response to treatment. Traditional endodontic treatment has been convenience-driven and endodontic-centric, primarily focused on operator needs, and has been decoupled from the restorative needs and tooth needs. Okay, well, I guess uh, I have a different perspective, and my perspective is unique to me. We all have our own perspectives. So I have traveled five million lecture-related miles. I've been in multiple continents. I've been in multiple, multiple dental schools around the world. And I would say that's completely nonsense because most endodontic departments are under the tutelage of restorative dentistry. Only in the United States, not so much now, but historically only in the United States had Department of Endodontics. In fact, in most schools today that don't have post-grad programs, Endo is under the restore department. There is a complete linkage and coupling between endo and restorative. And I've been saying for my entire life, start with the end in mind. So the end in mind is the casting or the restoration in that tooth. And so we're always driven each step along the way to the restorative needs. So uh, I don't really understand the decoupling part and I don't understand how it's driven by just uh, the endo part, because endo is only as good as the restoration that's on top of that tooth. I mean, probably the first question you ask yourself is, can this tooth be restored before I perform endodontics on it, right? One of the most common questions posed in endo 101, uh, that would mean the very basement level, is the tooth periodontally involved hopelessly or can it be made well? Is the tooth restorable? And sometimes we as endodontists will even send the case back to the restorative dentistry after a clean out that might be subgingival or maybe to the crest and we'll entertain ideas with crown lengthening. Is it restorable? How, are they comfortable doing this? Or would we best look at another alternative treatment plan? So uh, when we talk about needs, let's be clear. If I'm teaching endo, I'm not teaching how to make a line angle in a crown prep. If I'm teaching operative or crown and bridge, I'm not teaching patency. So they're, they're fields and disciplines and they both have requirements for success and they have to intermingle and coalesce. They can't be over here working independently and over here working. It has to be done with the patient in mind. So there are no dental needs from a dentist standpoint other than you're serving a patient, you wanna get maximum longevity, I've written many articles showing 25, 30, 40 year recalls, come on. 
So let's think about long-term results. And obviously, our endodontics is only as good as the restorative. And the restorative is only as good as the endodontic. So focus needs to be very sharp and intentional in both categories to get the whole to be greater than the sum of its parts. Okay, well said. The next quote. Scientific progress is generally hindered by trying to make by trying to take the past into account as a way to move forward. The elimination of bacteria, an unreasonable and unachievable endpoint, has become the objective of endodontic treatment with clinicians and educators going so far as to say that prevention or removal of microbes from the root canal system is the factor that determines if the treatment will be successful or not. Well, I guess we should start off by saying that 100% of all endodontic failures, the etiology is microbes. So, of course, when we're doing endodontics, our goal is to eliminate bacterial loads. We've never said, Ruddle has never said, I clean every microbe out of every tubule. Please step up and be like Ruddle. No, in fact, we even had Randy Cross on the show. We talked about bacterial loads and how you can reduce them. They never, with the indicator, the indicator, the device that measured, uh, it measures through uh, ATP. Uh, it, it's a, uh, a biomarker they can tell you the residual load and that we know from his work and work of others that if you get the load down uh, a certain percent, uh, you're going to have a lot greater tendency to have long-term success. So no, we've never cleaned out every bug. On the other hand, we never advocate leaving bugs intentionally because of this dormancy. Are we going to talk more about dormancy? Yes. Okay. So I would say uh, to finish that one, uh, your job is to reduce the vast majority of pulp tissue bacteria when present and their breakdown products. And if you're looking at the sacred restoration at the other end, how good is that restoration at the other end if we have endodontic failure? So I've practiced for 46 years, uh, at least for the last 15 years of my practice, over 90% of all new patients that I saw had already had treatment. So there is a lot of endodontic failures and sometimes there are restorative failures, okay? But let's just say the tooth was failing, either endo or primarily in restorative. All that has to be looked at. You can't be really squeaky clean over here and fat, battle and fight to save every enamel rod. And over here, you're saying, let's leave a little bit. Yeah, I was also a little thrown by his claim that scientific progress is hindered by taking the past into account. Well, I, uh, that's one of my favorite quotes, but he just didn't say the whole quote. And it's not my quote, but it's a quote I often use. If you want to create a compelling future, okay, a future with greater success and greater opportunity for patients, dentists alike, then you need to look at a future that is not about the past, but it takes the past into account. So I think this remark was rather silly because if you are going to the moon, you're gonna look at the body of science behind you and use that as a springboard. And yes, yeah, sometimes there's incremental growth and sometimes there's exponential growth, but it would be rather remarkably stupid to not take the past into account. Okay, the next quote. Microbial dormancy may result from the formation of persister cells as well as viable but non-culturable cells that resist traditional culturing techniques. It is likely then that our success may come more from altering the microbial environment and inducing bacterial dormancy as opposed to killing and removal. Perhaps a different, more conservative set of procedural objectives might be sufficient to induce dormancy. Well, I could go on with this for 30 minutes, but uh, we, we all know, let's be honest, let's be human, our goal is to clean out our root canal system. That means whatever's organically in there. Do we always do it? No. If you look at the Hess's work that we've presented many times on this show, we have really intricacies and complications and anatomical variability that is staggering. So, of course, technology has been coming. So we can clean better than we ever have. But do we get everything out? So I'll keep saying, no, we don't get everything out. But Ruddle has never taught, let's intentionally leave some bacteria behind. There was other in, uh, inferences in that article where you might treat three out of four canals. 
and put in calcium hydroxide and then have the patient come back in three months and take another CBCT to see if they were resolving their lesion. If they were resolving their lesion, you might leave the fourth canal. Dormancy. Let's talk about dormancy. Dormancy is a subpopulation of bacteria. Okay, so you have a lot of flora, a lot of phenotypes, okay, but you got uh, this cocktail of microorganisms. Dormancy is when a subpopulation of a certain phenotype goes dormant. And what happens is maybe there's not enough substrate to feed them. So what happens when there's not enough to feed them is they can either die, they can through plectonic movement, through cork communication, they, they can split off their population and swim downstream and set up residency in another area, a cul-de-sac, a fanatubule. But the sub population that is dormant, what wasn't mentioned in the article is it can be turned on and turned off because there are clonal switches and the clonal switches can speak. In other words, toxins can turn them on. Antitoxins can turn them on. Oxygen can turn them on. So maybe you're doing a crown prep and you're taking impressions and there's hydraulics. Maybe you get a few uh, oxygen cells in there. This can turn on these dormant bacteria and they can repopulate and come back, go into log phase, and they can be as bad as the original infection. So yeah, that happens. I'm not arguing there's not dormancy. When we leave them behind, maybe we uh, they calcify because maybe we cut off their substrates by sealing the root canal system in our third graphic. And if we did that perfectly, along with the coronal seal, you could say there's no substrates and maybe they stay dormant. But you know what? We're not trying to teach around the world an anecdotal sometimes event. We're trying to teach predictable treatment. I like his concepts a lot on restoration and how the restorative should drive the endo. I, I've never had a problem with that because I've taught that before John, I ever even knew John or John was even in dentistry, okay? So that's been a very long time discussion, but really we need both and we need both areas to step up and be all that they can be. Okay, next quote. The convergence of three pieces of technology has allowed a complete shift in the practice of endodontics. The microscope, low-dose focused field CBCT, and root form appropriate heat-treated NITI instruments. This new triad is now focused not on removal of bacteria, but on preservation of the paracervical dentin. So you're saying there's a technological triad? I thought we were talking about a microbiological-based triad. The microbiological-based triad was really about serving patients. It was about removing diseased tissue and making sick people well. It was about putting exquisite restorations on these teeth, showing the cusp. Those teeth that tend to fracture, we wanted to cover them. If they aren't heavily restored, maybe bonding can do it. But back to your question about the... Just say the last part again. Um, the new triad is now focused not on removal of bacteria, but on the preservation of the paracervical dentin. So in other words, if I buy a microscope and I buy a CBCT and I'm using heat tree and nitite files, I'm home free. I mean, that's what I need to have to be successful. What about all the evidence and science behind? Well, let's talk about the biology. Let's not talk about tools. Tools come and go like dirty laundry. So yeah, I agree. I had a microscope, you know, back in the mid 80s. Okay, we use nitite, started in 91, 92. Yeah, heat treatment came along recently, like in the last 10 years. So we have CBCT now, something else to help us plan our treatment. Why don't we use all that technology and agree, you know, back to the minimal instrumentation. Not only is it, do we want to save two structure in our access cavity? And if you have a big carrier's blood, of course, just go through the lesion itself and you might be able to get into the pulp chamber and do everything properly. Uh, I was talking about facial accesses on mandibular incisors 25 years ago, John. So hello, it's like, because 35% less tooth structure was destroyed doing facial accesses on mandibular incisors. So the access is always jockeyed and can be assigned based on the tooth, the presenting disease model, and then where we're trying to go with the patient. But at the end of the day, the triad isn't a bunch of tools. It should be based on biology, and I would think microbiology. Okay, the last quote I'm going to go to is how he ends, how Dr. Cotomy ends his article with a quote from a friend of his, Dr. Glenn Doyon, 
who is a restorative dentist turned endodontist. And so this is Glenn Doyon's quote in the Cotomy article. Mm. He says, one of the problems of the legacy endodontic culture is that they don't really know what works and what does not work long term. I'm talking about more than four years for the patients. The general dentists see and have the follow-ups because the patients come back to their office. People come back to the general dentist all the time to have their teeth cleaned. So the general dentists see what goes wrong. Endodontists don't really know what works and what doesn't over a long period of time. Endodontists think lack of evidence of failure is success. If you ask them, they think their cases are 95% successful. They just don't know. Did you say he's now an endodontist? I guess he just called himself stupid. I guess he doesn't have very long recalls. <laughs> well, look, I don't have any problem with any of these guys. You know, I, I hate it in the profession when we try to, you know, elevate a, a, a villain to, to elevate a hero. So it doesn't have to be fame or glory or power or money. There is really a biology and what we don't understand we're discovering. And I've always had vigorous recall systems. Hey, Glenn, is that his first name? Yes. Double N? No. Glenn. Glenn, if you charge enough for your endodontic procedures, your patients will find you. They'll come back. They'll want to see how they're doing. There was a lot of jokes about this about 20 years ago, how to increase your recalls, increase your fees. Because when people pay some, for something, the more they pay, the more they value it. Mm -hmm. And the more they value it, the more they want to make sure it's being taken care of and everything's fine. I have vigorous recall systems as good as any general dentist. People come back frequently, all the time, and we don't see them, Glenn, for four years. We see them at six months, one year, two years, five years, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, and I'm doing 40-year recalls. So I know many endodontists that are like myself, and I know that some probably don't worry so much about recalls. That's really just uh, specific to the operator. So if you want to see what you're doing, you can have a recall system. And I do think that endodontists perfectly know what's going on with their work because when they do a root canal on the posterior abutment, Glenn, of a four unit bridge and it blows up post endodontics, do you think they don't know it's failing? Do you think the general dentist says it's my fault, it's the bridge? No, they get sent right back to the source of the foundational work, the endodontics. So that's kind of an ignorant comment. And I don't know why that would even be made because I even have general dentists that mail me recall films on my patients. Well, he evidently thought it was a powerful enough quote to end the article with it. So clearly Dr. Cotomy makes some assumptions that are problematic and actually, frankly, sometimes just mind boggling. Um, I'm not really clear why he thinks an endodontist um, can't consider the restorative needs and why that's a new concept and why he can't, can't consider the restorative needs and at the same time have um, an adequate removal of bacteria. Bacteria. So that just seems problematic to me. One thing that's but, missing in a lot of these discussions, and I don't know, maybe these guys don't do this. In their, maybe they don't do this in Durango, Colorado, where uh, Cotomy's from. Maybe Doyen doesn't do this. But it's called study clubs. It's how our profession grew. If you go back to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, we weren't even recognized by the ADA as a special area of dentistry until 1963. So how did all that get learned back then? Because it was called interdisciplinary treatment. And study clubs formed in all the major cities and little towns. And 20, 30 doctors would go in and share their cases. And if you overshaped your canal, don't think the general dentist didn't see it and said, you weakened the root. Look, it fractured. Okay. So I'm for both sides. Let's keep all the two structure we can. And let's do the best endodontics we can. Okay, well, let's just move on. Briefly. They can coexist, right? Right. Let's move briefly to an article that Dr. John West published oh, yeah. in April of this year called The Endodontic Triad, Dead or Alive. And in this article, he identified 10 respected clinicians who generally get good results, and but who also do things very differently than he does. And he asked them to reveal what they do to shape, what they do to clean, and what they do to pack. And he also wanted to know what sealer they're using. So guess what the results were? They were all over the place and they were as diversified as the colleagues who submitted their work. So we had everybody doing something slightly different, but everybody was doing what? 
Everybody was using instruments and they reported the files they were using to clean their canals. I just might say this, uh, many of these so-called canals that are instrumented, they're neither clean nor shaped. So you're relying on technology. And lots of evidence has been, look, I wrote the preface for laser and endodontics, laser activated irrigation. And in that preface, I speak a lot about where we're going into the future, but they need to understand that flow channels help fluid dynamics. You can't say non-instrumentable canals anymore because too much work in that laser book that I wrote, there's a whole chapter on canal preparation. And that's for lasers and gentle wave wouldn't be that dissimilar. So anyway, they all were doing some kind of instrumentation, but the triads did, and they say now it's binary. Some of them uh, were using different uh, methods to irrigate and clean, gentle wave, lasers, endo activator, handheld syringes. They were all doing something, so that seems to be intact. We just don't agree on it. They all instrument, we just don't agree on the size and the parameters, and they're all filling. And of course, when you make these uh, truss accesses and orifice directed accesses and ninja accesses, you're bringing up a whole new level of complication for general dentists. I'm an educator, so I've taught tens of thousands of dentists around the world to try to do the best they can do. And everybody wins when they have an access where they can visualize uh, the orifices, they can look for fractures, cracks in the axial walls and stuff. So they all had in common that they were cleaning and shaping and filling, but yet they say, it's a uniad or it's a biad, but it's not a triad. So maybe uh, I know, I'll, I'll be kind. I want to point kind. something out. One of the clinicians surveyed was Dr. John Cotomy, and he apparently now uses Gentle Wave. So after downplaying the need to remove bacteria, now he's using Gentle Wave. So I guess maybe he's given up on trying to induce bacterial dormancy. Well, we talked about that in an article you and I wrote. I mean, the, I don't think the world really knew this, so I'll just be kind of blunt here. Two guys were going at it in dentistry a day, but most of the world didn't even know it except the two guys that wrote the articles. But I got pretty offended when Schilder was thrown under the bus because he never understood what Schilder taught. If he did, he wouldn't even be saying such ridiculous remarks. Schilder never gave a cookie cutter approach. Everyone was what funnel shape. It was a taper in the apical third or maintain the original anatomy, maintain the position of the frame, keep the frame as small as practical. So those were things that we're all still doing every single day. Okay, well, I think you mentioned this. Um, uh, John West did point out that some of the clinicians were opposed to using the word triad when they were doing the survey and they preferred uniad or biad. Well, you know, bottom line is they were all doing something to clean, something to shape and something to pack. So perhaps this is just a problem of semantics. <laughs> well, we gave an article, didn't we? Uh, we get a show, a segment, I think it was called Splitting Hairs. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the difference in some of these concepts are something like a human hair, and a human hair small is 06, 06 file. A medium one is an 08, 08 file, think 08 file. And then a coarse human hair was a size 10. A lot of the shaping below the orifice we're splitting hairs. In terms of the access cavity, geez, you got a big blowout lesion, use it, go through it and play off it, okay? I don't think these are controversies, but I think sometimes I've noticed after almost 50 years that sometimes people have to come up with a new disease model or a new way to look at it so that they feel good about themselves, they have something to talk about and that they can forward this uh, clandestine ideas because they don't have big public beings. They have little, they're, they're almost like zealots, these people. And they're, I noticed there's a fanaticism about two structure. Hey, listen, save every gram of two structure you can, but how about the endodontics? Well, it's good that this all promotes some discussion. So it's good to talk about it. And it didn't get solved today. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Good information. So we've had challenges and then we've had controversy and now we're going to finish with some fun. Another segment of what Phyllis thinks. So if you think of a Disney movie, something along the lines of Snow White, usually the female protagonist is in the woods singing and all of the woodland animals and birds are gathering around her. Well, that's my mom. So she's definitely an animal person. So this segment of what Phyllis thinks is gonna revolve around what she thinks about animals and the human-animal connection. 
So are you ready for some questions? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you grew up in Michigan, moving around a lot. Besides the standard cat and dog, what other kinds of pets did you have? First, we lived on a farm when I was really young. And that was the standard cows, um, ducks, chickens, all those fun things. But then my dad decided to go to college and packed up family of five. And we lived in a little small house trailer. And we had over 21 different pets during the next 10 years. And I just assumed everybody lived the same way that we did. And they were not the typical dogs and cats. We had raccoons, a flying squirrel, a possum, a mother opossum with all the babies hanging on her tail. That was only in the house one night. My mom put her foot down. Uh, a red fox, skunks, rabbits, goats, and some snakes. So excuse me? <laughs> yeah, I know you don't like the snakes. So were these pets in the house with you? Or were they in cages? They would start out in the house. I remember the raccoons started out in the house until they figured out how to open the little slider door and get out of the house trailer and ran away and we had to find them. And they were in a mulberry tree and had eaten all the mulberries off the tree. So then my dad built this tremendous, you know, two-story cage. He was always building cages and things. And they had a little ladder they would climb up and that's where they slept on that little platform. It was a little uh, like cave they slept in and they would, we feed them a boiled egg and they would tuck it under their arm and carry it up the stairs and then roll it <laughs> off the top so it would crack the shell so they could eat it. They were very smart. So yes, they would start very in the house. Very resourceful. They would start in the house and then get moved to a cage as soon as he got it built. But what so. about the flying squirrel and did it really fly? Oh uh, yeah, it's the kind that has the webbing uh -huh. that flies. So it kind of glides a, more? Yeah. Okay. I have a funny story about that I have to share. Okay. My dad, we were very poor, so he had one nice shirt and one nice suit for church. So we went, it, it was living in the trailer with us, and we went to church, and we came back, and, and somebody said, oh, your squirrel got out. Of course, everybody knew where all of the animals came <laughs> from. <laughs> your squirrel got out, and he's, up, he's in that tree over there. There was this big mansion house right near the edge of the trailer park, and my dad immediately took off his coat, raced over, he's climbing up the tree to go get Willie the squirrel. And he gets almost to him and the squirrel flies across to the chimney of this great big house. It was three or four stories tall. It was a huge house. Disappears at the chimney. And we're going, oh no. So my dad races down the tree, knocks on the door, says, can I check your furnace? This was in the summer, fortunately. So he goes racing in, opens the door of the furnace, and he's looking in, looking in, willy, willy, and splat. Willie jumped and landed right on his white shirt, and we rescued Willie. And we actually let him go soon after Did that. Did you rescue the shirt? <laughs> I think, I don't know what happened to the shirt. Sounds like it got I black. I was too young. So that was my dad in these stories. He was just a crazy nature person. So would you say he was the one that influenced all these pets? He did. I think starting out on a farm, you're around a lot of animals. I loved that. And then he brought them all home. He had a box in the trunk and every time he'd see something that he wanted to catch and bring home, he got skunks, he got raccoons, anything he would see, he'd slam on the brakes. We'd all sit there and wait. My mom, I could imagine my mom now what she must have been thinking and he'd run off into the woods or the field and get these animals and we'd take them home. Basically, well, <laughs> he devastated families by kidnapping <laughs> offspring. Well, that does show some skill, though, that I didn't know he had because it's not easy to catch these kinds of kinds no, of animals. No, <laughs> I, and why would you do that? I think it's outlawed <laughs> now to do stuff like that. <laughs> okay, well, when I was a kid, we, we had a Norwegian elk hound, Kizzy, and then eventually she had a baby, she had puppies, and mm. we kept the one lady. Yeah. And these were followed by Katie, Oscar, Lucy, and Jake, all Norwegian Elkhounds and Dobermans. Yes. So what did you like best about these breeds and what were the challenges? Well, the Norwegian Elkhound was uh, Mary, our receptionist at the time. She had a, a breeding kennel and she gave us the first puppy, Kizzy. And so that we had never heard of them before. They're the oldest, they're 6,000 years old, the Norwegian Elkhound breed. They're the original dogs, domestic dogs. And so that's how we got her and loved that. And then she had the puppies, we kept one and then Lady got killed on the road. And then we ended up getting a Doberman puppy to replace Lady and I never planned on having Dobermans, but his parents 
at a litter of, I don't know, 12 or 13. They have big litters. And so they gave us Katie, little tiny thing at the time. And that's how we got a Doberman. So I had to learn all about them, how to raise them. And we also got her her tail clipped and her ears done. Yes. At that time, that's what you did for yes. Dobermans. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. They're much more expressive, though, when you get the ears done. There's all kinds of body communications going on with those ears. They flip them around like antenna. Yeah, I do remember her. And, like, she'll it will change, like, she, if she hears something. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay, so our first Doberman was very strong and a bit out of control, so she went to dog school. Can you describe this experience, <laughs> and would you recommend dog school for someone with an out-of-control pet? Yes, definitely, especially large, strong animals. It, it's the best thing you can do for yourself and your family and for the dog, number one. And I was the one that had trouble getting her to do the things she was supposed to do. And it's a, a long, sad story. And eventually she stayed an extra week and I was- No, able... eventually uh, the girls and I took the dog home. We left you at the kennel and you had another week of training. And I passed. <laughs> See, we all, all four of us had to show that we could- um, Everybody in the family. Interact with the dog. Yeah, and, and you were the only one who couldn't yeah. for some reason. <laughs> He kept saying, she doesn't believe you. She doesn't believe you. She knows you still love her. You've got to make her think that it's, you know, it's a line in the sand. And that was just so hard for me to do. You know what? I would say that of us four, you are the most soft-spoken. So that that's probably help. has something that to do didn't with help. it. So. What'd you say? <laughs> oh. Um, so a lot of people think pets can help with mental health. So I imagine pets have been pretty busy during the pandemic. Do you recommend pets for someone having mental health issues and why or why not? I, I recommend it if they like animals, <laughs> but it is like bringing home a, a new baby. I mean, it's a lot of work. So they have to, for it to work, they have to like doing that. And I think it's so great if they do, because it takes them out of their head, out of themselves. And if you're caring for something else, you're a better person. Probably if you can get past like the first month, it will help your mental health. <laughs> yes. It that, might get not worse that initially. different than raising two girls, right? Like the year after <laughs> we were married, he brought a puppy home from college. Somebody was giving out puppies. Do you remember that? No. It was the cutest <laughs> little tiny brown puppy. He brought it home. And it's like, I was so excited. I mean, this was like my dad bringing animals home. But it lasted one night and he had to take it right back and give it back to the people that were passing him out. It was just way too much work for me working full time and him going to school full time. It didn't work out. And he doesn't even remember it. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, recently, Cassie, your miniature Cocker Spaniel, has had some health issues. What has been challenging about this and how far do you go financially and ethically giving medical care to a pet? Well, the financial part depends on your own you know, what you can do. And emotionally, you have to know when it's time to let go. And as a, an animal gets older, it's on your mind more. And she's 12 and a half now. So at, when this happened, we were thinking this might be it. It turned out it wasn't and she's fine now. But you do have to know when the time comes to let them go. You got to know when like to put Phyllis down, when to put <laughs> the dog down. You have to Make know these things. Down. Yeah. 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 So that's, it's just, everybody's different what they're willing to do. Okay. What about, what is the most annoying thing that you witness another, other pet owners do? Maybe you can also answer this one, dad, too. Anything annoying? Behavior, annoying things. I don't like dogs that jump up on you or, or that, are menacing. Well, you don't like the dog or you don't like the owner letting the dog the jump on The owner letting the dog. I always blame the owner. Yeah. yeah. I just got bit on the arm recently, as you know. You did. And it was a lady I've seen multiple times over months and months and months. And her dog just took the liberty to get a little chow on my arm. It must have thought it was a rubber <laughs> bone. Went right through the clothes and everything. I, I was mad at her, but not her dog. Yeah. I have been in situations I had where the dog down. is on a leash, <laughs> lunging at me, barking, and the owner's going, "Don't, oh, don't fine. worry, they're don't they worry. don't bite, they don't bite." <laughs> I don't know. I know. They Feels do. like we're on bone already. <laughs> okay, so now let's just to close out. Uh, what is the hardest challenge about having a pet? Oh, probably knowing that they're going to leave before you do. That's just the hardest thing 
to, to go to that place and you just, you want it to last forever and you know it's not going to. So you enjoy every day and love them all the, all the more. Okay, and what is the best part or the most rewarding part of having a pet? The unconditional love. They are always excited to see you and you can't do anything wrong. I love that part of it. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for that information, and thanks, Dad, for your input, too. Yeah, I've become very tolerant. <laughs> he has. Cassie's the first indoor animal that we've had in the last 12 years, and he's been a good sport, and he loves her as much as I do. No, she can read the paper with me. Yes, she does. <laughs> okay. Well, that's our show for today. See you next time on The Rubble Show.